thanks, thanks to you, dear Lord, for all you done. Yesterday's gone, today I'm in need, oh Lord, I give you thanks. I sing to you again, I say, thanks, thanks. I give you thanks for all you've done. I am so blessed. Hallelujah. My soul is at rest. Oh Lord, I give you thanks. Hallelujah. Day 37. Father, we are grateful for this time. We are praising you for enabling us to come upon this time, Lord God, at 8.23 in the a.m., Father, to proclaim your word. So I pray that you may open my eyes to see wonderful things out of your law. I also pray for my friends across the nations that, Lord, you may indeed be able to open their understanding, even to hear the word of God. I also pray, King of glory, for your grace to be upon us even to continue in the place of consistency. We thank you because you are helping us and we come yet again hungry and we come yet again to be filled of you. So we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's day 37 and what a joy to be able to proclaim the word of God at this time and also to proclaim his goodness in the land of the living. Day 37. So um, if you're new here, it's the first time to be able to tune to this. We are on a journey, a spiritual journey through the book of Psalms as the dashboard, but generally going through the entire scripture chapter by chapter, day by day, and we are in uh, day 37 since we began with Psalm 1 all the way heading to Psalm 150. And in there, we are also reading the book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of First uh, Second Chronicles now, and the book of John. And now we are heading on also the book of Ephesians, the book of Colossians, and the book of Revelation. Eight chapters in all. And the Lord has been able to help us. Today's title comes from the book of John, chapter 7, Rivers of Living Water. And that's where we're going to come to when we proclaim this. We thank God because he's helping us and we honor him in every way for bringing us this far. We honor the Lord especially so for giving us the grace and capacity and ability to be able to come because in the title of this psalm is that he will not forsake his saints. He will not forsake his saints. Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Don't fret. It leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Psalm 37 verse 10. A little while and the wild will be and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow. They bring down the poor and the needy to slay those whose ways are upright. But their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken. Better the little that the righteous have than the, will, than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken. But the Lord upholds the righteous. 
Listen to this. Hallelujah. The ways, the days of the blameless are known to the Lord and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. Beloved, these verses are power and I can testify to this testimony of the word of God becoming flesh even over the periods of time that we have been able to go through this journey of 150 days of Psalms. Hallelujah. We commenced in the month of March 2020 in the height of the COVID pandemic and the Lord constantly indeed cause this word to become flesh for us even through and through and the many testimonies that he has given us i encourage you dear beloved you could be in a difficult situation our friends up north in the northern part of kenya and in some parts of kenya that are going through difficult times of famine and prolonged doubt the word of the Lord says the days of the Lord, the days of the blameless are known to the Lord and their inheritance will endure forever. That God will not forsake his saints. He will be with them in the time of disaster. He will, they will not wither in the days of famine. They will enjoy plenty, but the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish, vanish like smoke. The wicked borrow and don't repay, but the righteous give generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be cut off. If the Lord delights in a man's ways, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. What a blessing to be able to, you know, come expressly and listen to these amazing scriptures becoming flesh for us as we are listening to them and hearing the word of the Lord by His grace and His mercy and by his capacity and his favor that is bestowed upon us every single day. That when we see the goodness of the Lord, we see his majesty, his power, being in the nations to meditate, memorize, read, hear God's word devotionally every single day. That by the grace of God and the capacity that he gives us, that we can be able to know that he's a faithful, faithful God who is always with us and he's always answering prayer whenever we are in his presence. It's a joy and privilege to know that the favor of God is with us, to know that the goodness of God is upon us, to know that the blessing of God is with us. That is the joy that we carry as children of God. It's a blessing and a great delight. Hallelujah. What a joy, beloved. What a big, big base blessing that the Lord has allowed unto us to see his goodness in the land of the living. It's a joy and privilege to see that we can be able to grow from one level of glory to another level of glory in the Lord as we depend on him. It's a joy to know that I am totally dependent on the Lord, that I don't have any other place for me to look up to, but unto the Lord himself. I don't have any other place to go to, but only to look unto his majesty. I don't have any other one to know. I don't have any other person to look to, but I'm only able to look to the one who knows my days, who is always with me, who is always on my path, who is always checking which direction I go and allowing us to come into this wonderful place where we can experience the supernatural by remaining in the presence of God. Psalm 37 verse 27 it says, Turn from evil and go good, then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord, it says, For the Lord loves the just 
and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever. But the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in forever. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks what is just. The law of his Lord is in his heart, his foot does not sleep. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives. But the Lord will not leave them in their power, or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Wait for the Lord. Keep his way. We will exalt you to inherit. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil. But soon he passed away and he was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace. But all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Psalm 37. We bless the name of the Lord because this is a riddle of prosperity of the wicked and the affliction. It says, the, 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 what it says, the riddle of the prosperity of the wicked and the affliction of the righteous. One thing that I will tell you, beloved, is that the believer should never waste time fretting about his enemies. He should not waste time fretting about his enemies, but should look forward with the eye of faith when he will see no reason to envy wicked people. O oh Lord, keep envy and jealousy away from my heart, that I may continue focusing on you and have a heart that pleases you all the days of my life. This should be the, our prayer constantly, every single day. Because even when you envy the wicked, their short-lived prosperity will come, will come to naught in the name of Jesus at the point of time. Those who make God their heart's delight will have their heart's desire and will be fully satisfied in Him. You can agree with me that satisfaction is not easy. For you to be able to get satisfaction is not an easy thing. And that is why the wicked should not be anything that we envy. Because one thing that we know is that their prosperity is short-lived. One thing that we know is that there is a future hope for the man of peace. I would like to mention this. Come what may, the saints are safe in Christ Jesus. And because he lives, I will live also. Because he lives as a believer, you will live also. As heirs with him. Heaven and eternity shall be ours. Who would not be? Who would not be a Christian on such terms? In spite of all the oppression of the godless. It's important for us to know that because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds my future and life is worth a living just because he lives. My God lives and because he lives, come what may, I am safe in Jesus. Rivers of living water shall flow out of your belly. He will not forsake his saints. Proverbs 22. Hallelujah. What a joy the Lord is helping us and we are moving in him as he enables us every single moment. A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. A prudent man sees danger and takes refuge. But the simple keep going and suffer for it. Humility and the fear of the Lord bring wealth and honor and life. 
In the parts of the wicked like thorns and snares, like thorns and snares, but he who guards his life stays far from them. It says, train a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. it says in verse 7, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower servant to the lender. And the, and the, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. He who sows wickedness, he who sows and the rod of his fury will be destroyed. A generous man will himself be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. Drive out the mocker and out goes strife. Quarrels and insights are ended. He who loves a pure heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king for a friend. The eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge. He frustrates the words of the unfaithful. Now let me speak these words to the students. If any of you are listening to me and you are a student, I want you to put a marking on Proverbs 22 verse 12. If at all your academic performance is having a challenge, you are not able to grasp what the teacher is teaching, or whenever, despite of what and how heavily you study, you are not able to remember the things that you have been studying, then this is the proverb that will break that bondage for you. This is the proverb that will turn around your position from the level of an, a lower class to an upper class with honors in your degree. And for those of you in high school and secondary school and elementary school, any kind of study and learning, I want you to know that God watches over biology, over physics. He watches over photography. Anything you are learning, the eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge. It is not just the, the scripture. When you love the Lord, He will give you the knowledge. Hallelujah. A discerning heart Six knowledge. God gives you wisdom and then he allows you into the realm of knowledge. Hallelujah. You are walking in there and you are discovering, wow, so this earth is moving ground, is going round the earth and you're discovering, oh wow, God has just created us with so many gases around, but there's only one gas that we are breathing called oxygen that is so precious. It's so precious for everything. It's precious for water. It's precious in the sea. Oxygen is precious all over. And guess what? He made the trees to make the oxygen. Wow. Look at that. It's knowledge. The eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge. But he frustrates the way of the unfaithful. So sons, daughters, be faithful to God. How do you do that? If you are in the family setting, honor your father and mother. Are you a wife? Submit to your husband. Are you a husband? Love your wife. Simple teaching. It does not need any interpretation. It does not need you to go to the mountains. It does not need you to go under the hills. It does not need you to fast and pray, to wear sackcloth, or to cut yourself like in Philippines. We do not need to harm our body physically for us to be able to just live the way God wants us to live. It says, children, obey your parents, honor your parents, uh, wives, submit to your husbands, respect your husbands, husbands, love your wives. It's so simple. So God allows us that the eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge. His eyes. So if you come to the sweet knowledge of that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, that knowledge alone will set you free. It will get you out of that bondage in the name of Jesus. It will get you out of that frustration in the name of Jesus. Because it frustrates the words of the one faithful. So if you are unfaithful, just get ready for frustration because the word of the Lord is there. It must be fulfilled. The eyes of the Lord watch over knowledge, but he frustrates the word of the unfaithful. So you need to remember that faithfulness is a beautiful thing that springs from the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
These wonderful warnings and instructions from the book of Proverbs, they are helping and they are graceful to us. I know that I'm helping my friends who are, stu who are students by this one verse. That if you now look to the Lord as that he longs to make you prosper, by you being faithful to him in prayer and studying book, doing assignment, it may not feel sweet when you are reading. It may not feel good when you are re revising. Eh, it may not feel good. Some others say, ah, the exam is very far. I cannot be able to read because of the exam is so far away. I'm only in kindergarten. Beloved of the Lord, I come to end that God delights to lift you into a new dimension. In Christ alone do we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. The sluggard. Listen, the sluggard says there's a lion outside. I would like to tell you this verse well, well, because a lot of believers are busy accusing where they come from, accusing, uh, you know, saying things that this is because of my spiritual background, because because of my father, this is because of my mother, that I am the way I am. Let me tell you, beloved, the Bible says the slothful man, eh, the indolent, the slothful, the, the, the sluggard, the lazy person. Laziness. Lazy. Hey. Lazy. Look at your neighbor and tell them, lazy. Are you lazy? Because laziness, the scripture tells us, the sluggard, that is the lazy man, he says there's a lion outside. He says I will be murdered in the street. The sluggard always has a, an excuse instead of an effort. You must change your excuses from the excuses to the efforts and let rivers of living water begin to flow out of you. You must begin to set your face to look to God and his strength. You will not be murdered in the streets. There will be no lions outside. If there are lions outside, you will cause the God of Daniel to shut their mouth because you are no longer walking in sluggishness. The sluggard is likened to the snail. The snail moves very, very slowly. It is a sluggish way of doing things. We must be awakened and have the sense of urgency in our spirit, knowing that the times are very short. And you have very little time on this side of the eternity. Whether you will grow to be 100 years, you will still run out of time. Whether you will grow to be 150 years, you will still run out of time. At 150 years old, you will not be able to go for missions. You will not be able to travel easily and with agility. There are some age when you get to some certain age. Ages, my dear friend. You cannot work unsupervised. You, can, you have to go back to the old time of becoming like a little child. There are ages that you people have been old until they become captives on earth. There is importance for God to enable us to work in our productive time and use that time well so that we will not say there is a lion outside. So that we will not say I will be murdered in the streets. I want you to say there is a lion outside. I will take its photograph and I will sell the photograph to the world. I will not be there to say the lion is outside and stay inside. No. I will not be murdered in the streets. No, that is not the portion of the children of God who has a river flowing inside of them. Listen to verse 14. The mouth of an adulteress is a deep pit. He is, he who is under the world's wrath will fall into it. Listen to verse 15. Folly <laughs> is bound <laughs> in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction will drive it away. Foolishness, in the King James it says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. But the rod of correction will drive it far from him. There are levels in your age where you need to know, This is a form of foolishness in my life right now. That I need the Lord to help me. In everything we are doing, we must seek God for wisdom. He says, he who presses the poor to increase his wealth and he who gives gifts to the rich will both come to poverty. Pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach.
for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have all of them ready on your lips so that you your trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you, have I not written 30 sayings for you? <sighs> Teaching sayings of counsel and knowledge. Teaching you true and, unre and reliable words so that you can give sound answers to whom who sent you. Do not exploit the poor because they are poor and do not crush the needy in God for the Lord will take up their case and will plunder those who plunder them. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Do not be a man who strikes hands in pledge or pulls up security for debts. If you lack the means to pay, your very bed will be snatched from under you. Do not move an ancient boundary stone set by your forefathers. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. Those who walk humbly with God, in obedience with the commands of God and his word, and his submission to the disposals of his providence, shall find true riches, true honor, comfort, and long life in this world, and eternal life, hallelujah, and eternal life, glory be to God, and eternal life at last. This is important for us to be able to know that these words are full of counsel. Listen to this counsel, even as I go away uh, into, into the book of uh, Ecclesiastes 1. It says, counsel, and this is Proverbs 20 verse 5, it says that counsel is in the heart of man like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. It says that God gives counsel inside you like deep water. And then it says that a man of understanding will draw it out. Is that something that God needs to put, has already put in your eternity. So you must be able to, you know, draw out. Out of your belly shall come rivers of living water. Hallelujah. What a joy. We move on to this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1. This is where we are coming back up again as the Lord helps us in the name of Jesus. We come to Ecclesiastes 1. It says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does the man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it sets. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome. More than one can say, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is filled of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything that one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old. And even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. I, the teacher, was king over Israel was in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid upon men. I have seen all things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, are chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, Look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied, then I applied, then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more the knowledge, the more the you know the more the knowledge 
It says what? The more the knowledge, the more the sorrow, the more the grief. This is a doctrine of vanity of the creature. Ecclesiastes actually helps us to understand the vanity of the creature and the impossibility of finding satisfaction without God. That's why soft drinks will never be able to satisfy your thirst. Bottles of water can never satisfy your thirst. You will quench it now, but you will feel be thirsty again. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. You need to understand that God has allowed us into the word of God to understand ourselves more. The counsel of God has been put into the heart of man, but a man of understanding is the only one who draws it out and begins to live according to the word. Just like that. All things considered as abstract from God and apart from Him, all worldly employments, enjoyments are vanity of vanities. If at all they don't spring up from your love and fear of God, hallelujah, it's going to catch up with you, Mr. President. You will discover that being president is not the only thing that you need as a human. You need a connection with God. Otherwise, all will be vanity of vanities. Hey, and if there were no supernatural methods of giving peace to the heart and another life to follow, we are made, we are indeed made in vain. If there is no eternity, we are here or in vain. So the supernatural enables and gives us purpose to please God, to live for Him. Hallelujah. To become like Him. All indeed is vanity. If Christ is not in the heart and if there be no hope of eternal life through acceptance of him, all is vanity. The things of the earth are passing away and hence are vanity if they be trusted in. There is a kingdom coming in which believers shall inherit substance and there there is no vanity. Hallelujah. I just want to bring your understanding to something. You remember the first time when you bought your mobile phone. They told you about the features. They said these features are like this, like this, like that, like that. Then less than two years, no matter how much money you invested in that gadget, it is out of date. It is no longer what is trending. There is a new one. And man's pursuit in life is like that. Even you buy right now the most expensive dress on earth. Next month, it's not going to be the most expensive dress. You are left, actually, it will end up sometimes in, in, uh, in, 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 the, in the hands of somebody that does not know its value. These are the things of wisdom and living for God. Let's go to the book of Second Chronicles. We need good things, but the Lord is helping us with wisdom. The book of Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter 2. It says, Solomon gave orders to build the, a temple for the name of the Lord and a royal palace for himself. He consecrated 70,000 men as carriers and 80,000 as stone cutters in the hills and 3,600 as foremen over them. Solomon sent this message to Hiram, king of Tyre. Send me cedar logs, as you did for my father David, when he sent you, sent him cedar to build a place to live in. Now I am about to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, and to dedicate it to him for burning fragrant incense before him, and for setting out the consecrated bread regularly, and making burnt offerings every morning and evening, and on Sabbaths and new moons, and at the appointed feast of the Lord our God. This is a lasting ordinance of Israel for Israel. The temple I am going to build will be great, because our God is greater than all other gods. But who is able to build a temple for him? Since the heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain him. Who then am I to build a temple for him, except as a place to burn sacrifices before him? Send me, therefore, a man 
skilled in gold and silver, bronze and iron, and in purple, crimson, and blue yarn, and experience in the art of engraving, to work in Judah and Jerusalem with my skilled work, uh, craftsmen whom my father David provided. Send me also cedar, pine, and algam logs from Lebanon, for I know that your men are skilled in cutting timber there. My men will work with yours to provide me with plenty of, 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 plenty of lumber because the temple I build must be large and magnificent. I will give your servants, the woodsmen who cut the timber, 20,000 cords of ground wheat, 20,000 cords of barley, 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of olive oil. Hiram, king of Tyre, replied by letter to Solomon, because the Lord loves you, his people, he has made you their king. And Hiram added, Praise be to the Lord God of Israel, who made heaven and the earth. He has given King David a wise son, endured with intelligence and discernment, who will build a temple for the Lord and a palace for himself. I am sending you, Huram Abi, a Maharadabasariakeyadabosaidisa, Hey, glory to God. It says, I'm sending you Huram Abi. Second Chronicles chapter 2 verse 13. Huram. Huram is Huram in the Hebrew. That is noble, whiteness, pure. That's what the name Huram means. You see, this man was a man skilled. He says, I'm sending you Huram Abi, a man of great skill. Hallelujah. I pray for you today. May the Lord place the anointing of Huram Abi upon you, that you will be skilled in what you do. That this man, Huram Abi, that God will allow you into that grace. To be a man or woman of great skill in whatever you do underline that one and take time to pray and tell god give me the skill of huram abi pray and prepare yourself because it takes work for skill to come it says verse 14 whose mother was done was from dan and whose father was from tyre he is trained to work in gold and silver and bronze and iron and stone and wood and with purple and with blue and crimson yarn and fine linen. He is experienced in all kinds of engraving and can execute any design given to him. He will work with your craftsmen and with those of my Lord David, your father. Now let my Lord send his servants the wheat and barley and olive oil and wine, he promised. And we will cut all the logs from Lebanon and you need and you, uh, f uh, that you need and will float them in rafts by sea down to Joppa. You can then take them up to Jerusalem. Solomon took a census of all the aliens who are in Israel. After the census, his father had taken and they were found to be 153, 600. He assigned 70,000 of them to be carriers and 80,000 to be 80,000 to be stone cutters in the hills and 3,000 foremen over them to keep the people working. Beloved of the Lord, this is the preparation of the building the temple. In 2 Chronicles chapter 4 to 6, is something that I want to read to us and then bring some little understanding. It says 4 to 6, 2 Chronicles chapter 2, 4 to 6. It says, Now I'm about to build a temple on the name of the Lord my God and dedicate it to him for burning a fragrant incense before him and for setting the consequent bread regularly and making burnt offerings every morning and evening and on the Sabbaths and the new moons and on the appointed feasts. This is the lasting ordinance. It says, The temple is going to be built to be great because the God is greater, because our God is greater than all other gods. But he who is able to build a temple for him, who is he who is able to build a temple for him since the heavens cannot contain him? Who then am I to build a temple for him except a place to burn sacrifices? It becomes us to go about every work for God with due sense of our utter insufficiency for it 
and our incapacity in ourselves to do anything adequate to the divine perfections. That's the place we need to go. That's how we need to come to God. Not that we are anointed, we are covered, we have the mantle, we have what? That is good, but we cannot go as qualified. We must go as insufficient. This is what Solomon is teaching us. It, we, we must go about every work of God with a sense of our utter insufficiency, not with our utter qualifications. You may come with certificates, you may come with all the things, gowns, clothes, uh, you may wear a bag, you may wear, uh, you know, robes, you may wear suits, you may wear collars, you may do anything. But let us work to God with an insufficiency. Knowing that we cannot really reach the divine perfection. We ask him for mercy. We ask him to help us. We ask him to lead us. And the little knowledge that you carry and you know. It is all but vanity without this knowledge. It will come to a place that you must have that insufficiency. For you to have the rivers of living water flowing through you. There are so many things blocking us from the rivers from flowing we have bitterness we have anger we have jealousy of the wicked envy of the wicked we have a lot of practices from our cultures we have so many things blocking us but it is with a due sense of our utter insufficiency for it and our incapacity in ourselves we are totally incapable of doing anything adequate to the divine perfections Beloved, the, the man that was sent, that is Huram, was a Gentile. The artificer, that great talented man was a Gentile. He was there for uniting Jews and Gentile in the gospel temple. You see, God created this in such a unique fashion. We would have gotten a man from Israel. It would have been all built by a Jew. But God caused the man from Tyre. This man was a Gentile from, from this area. The son of a woman of the daughters of Dan. Uniting the Jew and the Gentile in the gospel temple. We head out now to the wonderful book of John where we get our text, Rivers of Living Water. It's 9.05 in the a.m. and the beginning of the second watch of the day. For those of you who are praying in the notches of the day of the night, it's now 6.05 in the a.m. in Ghana. That is minus green, which meantime on the other side of Africa. And I will really thank God for the people of God in Accra. And we bless the Lord for the wonderful nation of Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Senegal, our wonderful people up there in Cameroon, all around Niger, around place Morocco, Libya, all that place there, Egypt. We look at you. All the continent of Africa, above Africa, in Ukraine, in Russia, all those places, God is still moving. Russia, you are not forsaken. Ukraine, you are not forsaken. God is in that matter. It's only Him who will bring peace into the nations of the earth. We pray for Israel very, very, very most sincerely. And we bless the Lord for the living church of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. We pray as we continue into John 7. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee purposely staying away from Judea because the Jews because the Jews they were taking away to his life they were they were waiting to take his life but when the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near Jesus brothers said to him you ought to live here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do no one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe him. Therefore Jesus told them, The right time for me has not yet come. For you 
any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of what is evil. What it does is evil. You go to the feast. You go to the feast. I'm yet going up to the feast because for me the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now, at the hallelujah, glory to God, that one right there is a principle for doing missions. There are some missions that you will not need to go publicly, you go in secret. This is wisdom that is right from the word of God. Verse 11. Now, at the feast, the Jews were waiting for him and asking, Where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, he is a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for the fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to preach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether it comes from uh, whatever I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honor for himself, but he who works for the honor of the one who sent him is a man of truth and there is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed. The crowd answered, Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle, and you are all astonished. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarch, you circumcised a child on the Sabbath. Now, if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for, deal, for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Verse 25. At this point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, Isn't this the man they're trying to kill? He's here, speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he's the Christ? But we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he comes from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple, calls, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here on my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. Verse 30. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Still many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, when the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees had the crowd whispering with such things about him. Then the chief priests and the, and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you only for a short time. And then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews say to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Will he go where the people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did the man then, what did he mean when he said, You will look for me, but you will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. On the last day and the great day of the feast, Jesus said and uh, stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, streams of living water will flow out from him. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? 
Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has also deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does your own law condemn anyone without first hearing him or find out what he has done? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you'll find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Then each went to his own home. Beloved, this Nicodemus, we encountered him earlier in the book of John chapter 3. And we see John, that Nicodemus, he received the teaching from Jesus of being born again. And he went back and was part of these elders. But one thing that we also learn is that it is the comfort of those who embrace Christ's doctrine that it is a divine doctrine. It is proven by the blessed experience of what he promises. He is the source of the refreshing fountain of the Holy Spirit, which comes to replenish the soul that thirsts for him and to supply a fullness of life that overflows in blessing to other lives. Beloved, you have not been saved personally for personal consumption. The way you have been saved by grace through faith is so that you can share the gospel with others. If you are not able to share the gospel with others, then you are not flowing in the rivers of life. You must be able to rise above talking only about your church, talking about only your pastor, Talking about only the leader of your church, your pastor, your prophet, your apostle. You must rise above that one. Because we have been saved through faith. Through, by grace, through faith, for that we may flow into others. The river does not stay stagnant. The river that stays stagnant has a lot of dead things in it. But the river that moves forward, the river that keeps flowing, it flows into other sources. And eventually it lands in the sea. And when it lands in the sea, it's collected again from where the waters come from. There they shall return again. This is Ecclesiastes 1. Beloved, I come to encourage you these things because it's important. We have seen a lot of believers. They live personal, personalized, customized, internalized, secret society, Christianity. That you will be shocked to learn that so and so is a believer because his Christianity is hidden. Only your life should be hidden in Christ, not your life. Not, not, your, not your experience on the earth. Your life should be hidden in Christ. But on earth it should be open to all. The people should know that in Christ alone do we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. I meet people, they ask me, are you a pastor? I ask myself a question. Does it mean a man who loves God must be a pastor? Does it mean a man that is seeking out to read the word of God and to lead others to Christ must be called a name? Remember, it's in our inadequacy. Our God is in heaven. We cannot build any temple he can fit. It's only a place where we create and we say, God, we are here as people gathered to be strengthened with all power according to your glorious might so that we may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to you who has qualified us in the inheritance to share in the inheritance of his saints, of your saints. In the kingdom of light. Beloved, the sweet inheritance from the Lord can only be given to sons. It cannot be given to children. It cannot be given to them that have not matured. Yet, in our inadequacies, we must come to God seeking him for mercy. Because either Jesus was merely a good man, a deceiver, or what he claimed, the divine son of God. But if he is not what he claimed... He cannot be a good man. Those who deny 
that Christ is God, therefore put him on the same level with the devil. This is the thing. This is a serious matter. Christ was the divine son of God. Because Satan is a deceiver. Our Christ is not a deceiver. Revelation 20 verse 10. It says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, and where the beast and the false prophet and all shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20 verse 10. So Christ is the divine son of God. He is what he claimed. He doesn't have to have an image. I don't need to see a picture of a man for me to believe. The movies are good for us to enact the days and the, the producers of the Christ movie and the Jesus movie put for us an image that looks like a Jewish man in his thirties, the one that lived in those days. But that picture inside the Christian movie about this being Jesus does not make him Jesus. Are we together? Are we together class? Hallelujah. I believe we are together because many have printed pictures and put in their houses and saying this is Jesus. Say this is Jesus. They put a picture of a white man with a funny uh, picture of uh, something with thorns in their heart. That's idolatry. Pull down those pictures. Jesus is not there. Make others go and, uh, and go to the extent of making idols. Literal images, idols. And they put it there and they say, this is the holy mother of Jesus. And they go there. And demons know how to play around. <laughs> so demons will inhabit that thing you are worshipping. So they will give you a sense of knowledge that there is God answering you. But it's the demons. Because God says in Exodus 20 verse 4 and 5, Thou shalt not have any idol. You shall not make any image or bow down to them. So, even in the name of religion, when you bow down, even when you are invited to a church, and you are bowing down to a glass, a glass table, really, what is the glass table got to do? We respect the area we build in a church and call it an altar. But if we start thinking that God is there in front of the church, hey, that is where we miss it. No water flowing. We move on because we got to go in the book of Exodus, Ephesians. Ephesians, hallelujah. Beautiful Ephesians. What a joy the Lord is helping us to be able to come into the wonderful book of Ephesians where we are getting some wonderful knowledge even from the Lord because the Lord watches over knowledge. The Lord sees the knowledge. It's the Lord who watches over over the knowledge it's the lord who watches over the knowledge it is not us so the knowledge that you have received it's the lord who helps us and he is here with us leading us by his righteousness and we bless his mighty name and glorify his holy name for he is a faithful 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 god that we can always gather to and we can be able to come to this wonderful well where rivers of living water will spring out of that particular river. What a joy. Hallelujah. Good to see you, my sister Jeanette Navarez. Hallelujah. Together with your household, Isaac, and the wonderful people watching over there, and also our brothers and sisters in Spain, brother uh, Caesar, a wonderful friend in love, Lord Glogo, David. We also want to thank God for others across the nations that God is allowing us, and particularly even here in the land of Kenya, where I have lots of friends everywhere. We've gone for missions and we bless the name of the Lord every single day. Ephesians. Ephesians 2. As for you, you are dead in transgressions and sins which you used to live. And when you walked in the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, who is now at work in those who are disobedient? All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of this great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, underline that, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive 
with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us up with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages He might show us the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision that is done by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants, to the promise, covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For himself is our peace. He who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have both access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too were being built to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all those who have not met me personally. My purpose is that you may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that you may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that you may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am present from you in the body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith is in Christ. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith that you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition but the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form and you have been given fullness in Christ who is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised in putting off the sinful nature not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead, when you are dead in your sins and in the circumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the written code, with all its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, don't let anyone take you captive by what you... Let not anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a new or a bath or the Sabbath day. These 
are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a man goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though as you still belong to it do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are destined to perish because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations have indeed an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any restraining sensual indulgence. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. 14. This is where we are heading as we come to close this wonderful time of proclaiming God's word. Now I know a lot of you may say, why are you not explaining to us the verses? Why are you not? Because this is the river, hallelujah, of living water, hallelujah, flowing from our bellies. The word of God is potent. That is why you cannot settle just for small, small verses and quotes for your walk with God. You must tell the Lord, I need more. Hallelujah. That when you are talking to the Lord, you have passages about who he is. Talking to him from them. And being able to know, I'm praying this so that I may live a life worthy of the Lord. And that I may please him in every way. That I may bear fruit in every good work. Growing in the knowledge of God. One thing that you must do is grow. So as you keep coming to these apostolic teachings every day, reading Ephesians, reading Colossians, that is the direction of this journey. As you do this, God is helping you. Do not taste, do not touch, do not handle. A lot of voices are out into the world. But one thing I want you to know, they will perish because they are based on human commands and teachings. Our inadequacy to be able to come to God with that pure divine state is the one that keeps us coming to him every day, telling him, Father, I long to be rooted and established in love. The greatest gift you can pray and ask for is love. Love. Love your neighbors. As you love yourself. Revelation chapter 14. That's where we are as you come to learn this plane as the Lord helps us. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing and for helping us. So it says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him one forty-four thousand who had his name and his father's name on their forehead. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters, like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was the harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been named, who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who do not defile, who do not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blessed. Then I saw air and he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth to every nation tribe language and people he saw he said in a loud voice now listen this is the eternal gospel that is being carried by an angel that is flying in mid-air he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth to every nation tribe language and people i said in a loud voice fear god and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come worship him who made the heavens the sea the are uh, the, the the heavens 
the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Look at how simple the eternal gospel is. Simple, simple gospel. Simple gospel. Yet man cannot fathom. The angel of the Lord comes and says, this is the eternal gospel. In a loud voice, fear God, give him glory. Take notes. Fear God, give him glory. Because the hour of judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. There is a difference between the sea and the springs of water. Big difference. They are all water. But the sea is full of salt. But the springs of water are drinkable. You must know this is the eternal gospel. Simple, simple gospel. Fear God, give him glory. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Listen to verse 8. The second angel followed and said, Fallen! Fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of our adulteries. And a third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast or end his image. For anyone who receives the mark of his name. Or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Listen to this. Revelation 14, 11. And the smoke of their torment rises up forever. What? There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and his image. Or anyone who receives the mark of his name. That is happening now. There are people who don't rest. Kabisa, kabisa. Maka nawekwa dawa. Ndiwaweze kupumzika. Because of this worshipping of the beast. Because of this worshipping of the image. Rest will not be your portion. One thing that you must know. These scriptures are alive. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor, for their deeds will follow them. I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was like that of a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple. He called in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Take your sharp sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud shoo, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel, who had charge of the fire, came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take a sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle gathered its grapes and threw them in the great winepress of God's fury, God's wrath. They were trampled in the great winepress outside the city and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Beloved, they shall be, they shall be preserved, they shall be preserved during the great tribulation period, a great company out of Israel who will follow the Lamb and give glory to Him at whatever cost. There will be also a multitude of Gentiles redeemed by the acceptance of the everlasting gospel. But at the cost of martyrdom, woe to those who worship the beast and receive his mark. For they will be tormented in hell 
forever. Beloved, this is the, about the tribulation, saints and sinners. Choose now to have the Lord Jesus as your Lord in your heart. You don't have to wait for the martyrdom and for this difficult time coming to the earth. He who bears the golden crown is none other than the Lord Jesus, who will a short time after this be found wearing a crown of, of will be he will be seen, you know, wearing a crown of universal sovereignty. At the close of the great tribulation, he will he will thrust in the sickle to cut down the earth's harvest of evil. This will be at Armageddon, which will then have come to its culmination, according to Mark 4, verse 29. It says, But when the fruit is brought forth immediately, he put it in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Beloved, the harvest has come of the earth. It's time for you, if you are not born again, Romans 10, verse 9, it says this, mm. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I pray for you today. May the Lord cause salvation to come upon your heart. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord. I believe in my heart. God raised you from the dead. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. I am born again. The old is gone. The new has come. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and with your fire. In Jesus' name, Amen. Beloved, if you pray that prayer, if you the old is gone and the new has come. I thank you for watching this broadcast till the end. Shalom, shalom, shalom. You can reach me on this number plus two five four seven two two zero eight seven zero eight seven for your love gifts, your offerings. You may use the same number. You can use PayPal if you are uh, want to send something through your PayPal account. And I would like to also connect with you as we pray together. What a joy that God is teaching us and this knowledge that the Lord watches over knowledge. That is the beauty that we carry today. May he continue to release that knowledge to us so that we may be filled with his will and the knowledge of his will through all wisdom, spiritual wisdom and understanding. Shalom. I love you all. My name is Malcolm David. Shalom.